Hey, Michael, we can start. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you're on the East Coast, good morning. If you're on the West Coast, good evening. If you're in Israel or Poland or anywhere in Europe, we have a very special uh, panel this afternoon. We are commemorating and honoring, and we should indeed say at this point, celebrating the first Survivor's Day, a day not devoted to the dead, but to the living and to the life in which they have led in the aftermath of the Holocaust. This is a day that is long overdue, and we are privileged to live with survivors still with us and still active and really the moral teachers of this and the next generation. Um, let me shape for a moment what our program is going to be today, which is we're going to, we have three guests. We have Stephanie Seltzer, we have Gabriella Major, and we have Marion Tolsky. Um, and we have asked them to spend much less time talking about their Holocaust years and much more time talking about their life as survivors, because the theme of today is to honor survivors and honor survival. We're going to begin with a very special moment because this day was chosen by my colleague and friend and partner in crime, Jonathan Ornstein, who suggested that the day we choose is June 24th, which happens also to be Marin Tulski's uh, birthday. So we're going to begin by saying to Marion, happy birthday to you and many happy returns. So this is a special day for you and we are honored to have you on your birthday. Thank and you, thank you. Okay, so let's begin by asking each of them just to give you a few words about their Holocaust background and then we'll talk about the journey they made in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Let's begin uh, ladies first with Stephanie, please. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, I was born, no secrets about age here. I was born in 38. And my earliest memories go back to being smuggled out of the ghetto when I was just maybe not quite three and a half. And I remember these things very, very clearly because I, my mother carefully drilled me on what I was and how I was to behave. So I was not in just one, but once I've done a lot of speaking since the 70s to high school students, college students. And I remember once being asked, how many different hiding places were you in? And so I actually sat down and wrote down, I had been in seven different hiding place, places. And of course, each time, very often I was completely hidden. I couldn't even walk up to the window because I couldn't be seen from the outside. I officially didn't exist. And also other times I had to assume a different name. So I was Teresa and I was Maria and I was Vanda, all these different things. But as I said, I survived in seven different places. But um, my mother came to get me just at the beginning of the Warsaw Uprising, not the ghetto uprising, the Warsaw, the Polish Warsaw Uprising. Let, let, me, let me help our audience for one moment. Um, there are two forms of hiding. One is hiding where you are living so no one sees you. The other is passing, and passing mean pretending not to be who you are, but to be a non-Jew and what uh, Stephanie's told us is she had both experiences. And the other thing is, for those of you who are chronologically minded, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was April 1943. The Warsaw Uprising was August and September 1944, when Soviet troops were on the other side of the Vistula River. And the Poles thought that if they revolted, they could be self-liberating but the Soviets let the Germans have at the Poles and only then were they willing to cross the river and conquer uh, Poland. Gabriela, tell us for a moment of your experience. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, okay, so I am from Hungary uh, 
And you probably will know that Hungary was invaded last March 19, 1944. And I was only two years old. Uh, second largest city of Hungary. Um, my father was already six months in the, well, the forced labor camp, but they didn't call it that. He first day, decept it was deceptive that it was like a workers army. Anyway, uh, we, uh, right away, they ransacked our homes. And within two to three weeks, they had two ghettos form formed in Debrecen. And so we had to go into the ghetto because we were outside of the ghetto. And I don't have to tell you all no, in the ghetto in one room, nine to 10 people. Uh, my mother was only allowed to bring just a few little things. She brought for me my, my favorite doll and my potty. Um, this was going on for several months with hardly any food, et cetera. And then we actually had to go to another ghetto, which was even worse on the outskirts of the city. And then we were um, suddenly, you've got to get into the cattle cars. Now, you need to know that from Hungary, uh, under the leadership of Adolf Eichmann, they were going to their last ditch effort. They were losing basically the war. Uh, but at that point, they were going to annihilate all the Jews. Uh, almost 600,000 Jews were murdered. We went into the, into, it was obvious that we were going to Auschwitz but I wouldn't be here then. So there was a detour um, after three days in the cattle cars without anything to drink, anything to eat, no air, et cetera, et cetera. And we landed in Austria, uh, Strasshof concentration camp, which was a forced labor camp. Uh, we don't have the time to really talk about that, but we were there for nine months. My mother actually was working on rooftops, piling bricks. I was there, kind of no nanny, no babysitter. I was taking care of myself and uh, I became very ill and they thought I was going to not make it because I had every child with contagious disease. But thank God I'm here. And so we were liberated in 45 by the Russians. And somehow my mother, my, my grandmother was with us. She died in the camp. And um, we somehow made it back to Hungary. Marion, tell us very briefly, first of all, again, happy birthday, Marion. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and your experience during the Holocaust, please. Well, <clears throat> I'm much older than my girl, uh, colleagues, but then my girlfriends here who presented their biography. As you know, I was, when the war started, I was 13, but already uh, I attended uh, a, a gymnasium, a, a high school, a Hebrew high school. My father was an outstanding Zionist, and so he tried to raise me in this spirit I was raised in the ghetto. Uh, I have no time now to tell you why, but because they were in my milieu and were mm, the most active and I wanted to do something. I was, uh, I, I joined the leftist underground movement in the ghetto. We, and we were deported almost with the last transport to the ghetto, Wuch, it was Wuch, Litfenstadt, to Auschwitz, to St. Bekitze. After Auschwitz, a west march to Buchenwald, after Buchenwald, a death march to Tresenstadt, where I was dying, but I survived. Okay, 
Uh, just one thing, what year did you arrive in Auschwitz? 1944. Yeah. Just exactly, exactly after the Hungarian mm, extermination, Holocaust. Yeah. yeah, the deportation from Hungary ended on July 8th, and then the deportation from Lodge began uh, a little bit later. In the early uh, in late late July and early August, 1944. Let's now talk uh, about what is the theme of today. Tell, tell us a little bit about your journey afterwards. So let's again begin. Let's begin with Gabriella. Just to you were uh, again a three-year-old or four-year-old child when you were liberated. Hey. So tell us yeah. your story. Tell us your story. Okay. So, um, well, I returned with my mother and we first were in Budapest. She remembered my uncle's address. We made it there and we finally had my father, thank God, made it back also. And so we went back to Debrecen. That's, you know, we had to start a life again. And unfortunately, most of my family extended family was wiped out, they were murdered. And I actually, even I remember being a young child asking, how, how could you even start? How is it possible when, when your parents were murdered, when all your brothers and sisters and, and their children, etc. They kept on saying it was a mass tragedy and we don't have any other choice. You are our child and we have to we have to make it for you. So 1945-46, uh, Hungary, in Hungary, and I, I'm sure that Marion can, he knows the same thing happened, I think, in Poland. The government changed to communism. My father had been a landowner, not a landowner. Jews couldn't own land, but he, he had, a, they had a lot of land lease. So he was gonna get back his business. Yes, for two minutes, he got back his business and then he had to give it to the government because they nationalized all businesses. And my mother, who was valedictorian in her gymnasium in Hungary, before the war, as you all know, there was, or most of you know, there was what they called the numerous clausus or quota system that if you were a Jew, you couldn't go to university. After the war, this was the one good thing my mother was able to go to university and she realized that it wasn't just because she wanted to get more education, it was because she needed a profession, she got some kind of a job. And a few years later, I started elementary school. Um, for two months, I was in a Jewish school, and after two months, they closed the school. I was the only child, the only Jewish child in, in, the, class, in, the, in the school, in definitely in my grade, and I didn't know anybody else who was Jewish. Um, I mentioned that because I had kind of a double life throughout my childhood, uh, although, I was very well, um, you know, I, I always was able to get, I was okay. You know what I mean? I had friends, not Jewish, but I had friends, but no one knew really my life. Now, nobody ever told me that I shouldn't talk about my life, my home life. So I was one person inside the home and one person outside the house. What does this mean? It meant, it meant that my, my father especially, but our home was a Jewish Orthodox home, modern Orthodox as we call it today. And so we observed Friday night, we observed Shabbat, then we observed the holidays, but I never talked about that. And I never talked about the Lager, you know, the concentration camp, I never talked about any of this, although I adapted well and you know, had good friends. I did go to trim the tree 
help to trim the tree for my girlfriend, but no one ever came just in the afternoon, normal days, but never on Shabbat or holidays. Um, my father worked, I don't know if any of you has been to Hungary. Nobody. Okay, so Ayol. in Budapest, we actually, you were, okay. So I've, I've been, we, I was I've, in Budapest. Okay, so then you'll know what I'm talking about. I was seven years old when we moved in 49 up to Budapest. Why did, we, why did we do that? My father was very well known in the community, in the Jewish community. He actually wanted to make Aliyah. He made all the, everything was done. But my mother said, I just can't finally, you know, she was at finishing the school, the university. She says, I, finally, we have some normalcy. I just can't do it. Okay, so we didn't go. Um, but we went up to Budapest so that he would not be so well known. And why is that important? Because they were going to, they were actually deporting uh, anyone, but they were rather deporting Jews than non-Jews, but non-Jews also. If they had been wealthy, they might be deported. So this way, low profile, we were in Budapest. Um, now, my father will have a different job in his field. He was also in, the, in grains, grain merchant. But of course, this is just a regular governmental position. And my mother started teaching. Um, fast forward, 1956, September 23rd. I lived on the Buddha side. And let's remind our audience that 1956 was the Hungarian uprising. If I never and, tell that, we're going to... Okay, so you, I just want, uh, want them to be prepared. This was uh, a moment uh, of unusual promise and peril. Exactly. You know what happened? Right next door to me is where the revolution broke out. Okay, freedom fighters were going to overthrow, and they did for a little while, communism, get rid of the Russians. And it sounded very good. And you would think, oh, this was going to be a good thing for you, right? Not for us Jews. Uh, there were lots of parties, suddenly political parties formed. And again, anti-Semitism really, really showed its ugly face. And in smaller cities and towns, they were already um, beating Jews, and some places they killed Jews. And in my father, my father was a manager at that point. He was also having a hard time at work. So I was 14. And, um, you know, I just started high school a few weeks. And I was excited about that because I was now going to the pest side. And on the pest side, there were more you know, in the school, there were more Jewish kids. And it's gymnasium, high school. But you see, I had a very bad resume. You know, every kid has a chart in school. And in that, they wrote Jid, Jido, which is Jew. And next to it, and you probably know, Kulak. Kulak meant a landowner, wealthy, whatever. That was actually not a Hungarian, it was a Russian word. This chart was going also to my high school. And I was an excellent student in elementary school and I was going to continue to work very hard. But I said to my father, I do not know, I do, I, I'm afraid that I'm not gonna be able to get into medical school. And, you know, I said to him, if you want me to marry a Jewish boy, this is at 14. Um, we got to get out of here. And I seated him down. They really had, they didn't really want to go. And I prevailed on him. My mother kind of, she really wasn't going to go. We kind of picked her up. And we left on November 30th. November 4th, the Russians came back. Everything went back to the communist era. However, 
I just, at that point, I said, we must escape. Now, this was kind of mature of me. Of course, I didn't know what it meant to be an immigrant and, and so on. So that's a whole other story, but I'll just tell you that we made it. We made it across the border. So let's, now, a question? Swi let's now switch and hear. Uh, so far, we've had you through pre-war, through the Holocaust, and now through the um, post-war and the Hungarian Revolution. Let's hear from Stephanie so we catch sure. her up and we'll come back, we'll come back to you, Gabriella. Well, um, I'm going back a little bit to the war experience. Excuse me. <clears throat> so I, I mentioned having been in seven hiding places and you mentioned being with a doll. No, one of the hiding places, I had the one doll that I had taken with me when I was smuggled out of the ghetto. And I remembered going to my grandparents' business. My grandparents manufactured glassware and imported better glassware, porcelain from Germany. And I remember my mother, in those days you made a doll out of cloth, you know, and you stuffed the, the body of the doll with what was really sawdust. And I remember my cousin taking me to the store to be stuffed like that and the Gestapo following us in the Jeep, trying to run us down. So that's my memory of being with the doll. That's the doll I came out with. And my first hiding place was, uh, I found out after the war that the woman who had smuggled me out was a prostitute. I found out after the war. Why? Because a prostitute, there was no contraception devices back then. So prostitutes could have a child that they had not acknowledged having before. So supposedly this prostitute was trying to pass me off as her daughter, but it didn't work because when she took me, uh, a man was cutting down a tree in this village, you know, I mean, very primitive. When I mean village, I don't mean like the United States village. I mean, extremely primitive. And then and there was a branch fell on his foot and he said, Oy vey. And everybody laughed because they knew his background. They knew his parents, his grandparents, and they knew that he was just copying a Jewish expression. But evidently I said, at least that's what the woman who was hiding me said, that when I uh, I said when my grandmother fell down the stairs, she also said, Oy vey. And that was enough to give me away. So the woman wanted to get rid of me. Plus they already had all the money that my mother had get paid and all my clothing and everything. So they called the prostitute back to come and pick me up. And she took me to Warsaw. And that's where I was from there on. I was in different hiding places. But in this original place, there was a, a boy was lighting, you know, like a, like a fire in the yard to, for cooking. And he grabbed the doll and threw it into the fire. So I never again had a doll during the war. I never again had another toy all throughout the war. And one of my last hiding places before the Warsaw Uprising was uh, with a woman who was hiding me. Yes, she was being paid by my mother, but she was hiding me at great risk to her own life and that of her daughter. And it's hard to believe but her brother, this woman's brother, worked for the Gestapo as a Jew hunter. He would go out on the streets and, you know, find the Jews and turn them in, and the Germans would pay him for it. Why was he able to do that? Because he could recognize who was Jewish and who wasn't, whereas the Germans were in a foreign country and they didn't know. So um, this is what happened. I never had another doll, you know, from that point on. And I was reunited with my mother, you know, and she came to get me and took me to Warsaw. And from there on, I was in all these different hiding places, as I said, seven different ones. And um, the last hiding place was with a very nice woman who took me in. And as I said, she at great risk to her own life. And uh, this brother of hers that I mentioned would sit in the dining room where I was hidden under the dining room table. 
because in those days, the tablecloth went down to the floor and I was under the table. I had a party chair under there, but I was afraid to use it. I had no toys. So I used to pull out my hair one at a time, I remember, and I used to put it out in patterns like a heart or a flower. And uh, this woman's brother would sit there, you know, not far from me, just a couple of feet from me. And I had to be very, very quiet. And he would spend definitely all the nights there and sometimes even during the day. We had very minimal food, just a little bit of black bread dipped in oil. And that was so, about it. So Stephanie, take us post-war. Post-war, my mother came to get me on the second day of the Warsaw Uprising, as I said, not the ghetto uprising, the Warsaw Uprising. And uh, the Russians were coming in and we were marched. You probably know the story. We were marched out of Warsaw. And uh, we were marched for three days and then we were put on train. And I remember that before we were to get on the train, the word was spread that the Red Cross was waiting at the train and that children could get to pick whether they wanted an apple or a piece of bread with a sugar cube. And I don't remember, I remember having this long discussion with my mother as to which I should choose, but I don't remember what I chose. Anyway, we were on these trains and we were taken, we were like sardines squeezed in, of course, not as Jews, but you know, the Polish people. And my mother and I had nothing to eat. My mother used to say after the war that she had been very proud that even though some of the other people had some bread with them or something, and if the train stopped in a village, people would hand out pieces of bread because they were expecting to get paid. Some people had some money, but my mother had no money, so we couldn't get anything. And my mother used to say that she was so proud that I never cried. I never said, I'm hungry. We just went to a village, a very, very primitive place near Krakow. And my mother had um, an ulcer and she had a hemorrhage and the priest came with a carriage. He was given the last rites of the Catholic church and she was taken to a hospital. And I was left in this peasant place. And um, that's, where I was when we were finally liberated by the Russians. But before that, the place in which I was, was also the place where there were some German soldiers, you know, in that house. And I remember one of them being, a, I remember him as a very kind person because he would take me on his knee and share his rations with me. And he would cover me with his own blanket. It turns out, when my mother came back after the Russian had come in and she had been discharged from the hospital, she somehow got to talking to him, even though it might give you a way to acknowledge that you spoke German, but somehow she found out that he was from Vienna. And much later on, after my mother and I escaped from Poland in 1946, October 46, we were in Vienna for six years in the DP camps and I had TB so we couldn't come to the United States. I didn't come until 1962. And I remember the whole time we were in Vienna, my mother used to go to the place where this man had told him, told my mother his family lived because she wanted to know if he had ever come back because she was so grateful that he had done something good for me, but we never found out that he survived. So, so Marion, take us through your experience as well. Yeah, so let's start with the first day of liberation. My first day of liberation was May the 9th. Theresienstadt, where I arrived one week, uh, 10 days earlier, after the second very long death march from Buchenwald. And to make a long story short, my weight was 32 kilo. I was always dying, always in agony. It was already quiet in the that I got even a bed. It was nice, but I couldn't eat anything, whatever 
they offered me in half an hour, I had to vomit it. I couldn't keep it. It was a full diarrhea, all sickness you can even imagine. Mm, I can tell you that May the 9th, when the Germans left Trainstadt and the Russians not yet arrived, it was uh, some hours, a friend of mine who was together with me, whom you know, Shmuel Krakowski, the, who afterward, afterwards would become the chief of the archives in Yad Vashem, whose number was next to mine. We were together, we passed together through all the march, death marches and all the camps. He came with a little cup of jam and told me, yeah, I have for you. I couldn't eat even this. I couldn't eat. So it was rather a matter of days to die. And here, something, a miracle, which was, by the way, after it's described by a, a, a university professor, a medicine doctor, I guess his name was Vinegar from Prague, who described this as a phenomenon, as a, as a wonder. And I got, in time of the, the death march, I was incubed by lice with typhus. And this was the time of incubation. And here is what the eruption. A fever, high fever, 41 degrees for a couple of days. Usually it should kill me, but it saved me. It saved my life because it killed all other diseases and I survived. Mm. But after, afterwards, I was still in a field, in a Russian field hospital, military field hospital. It was joined with, with some Czech um, doctors. Um, and <clears throat> then it lasted almost, yes, three months, three months, little bit to recover, but still I was sick. And in the meantime, you, Michael, you know, there was a short time when Truman accepted a short quota of Jewish kids to be uh, permitted to enter, to get uh, American citizenship. And I was offered, I was offered, and I rejected it. I rejected it because I wanted going back to Poland. Now, you will ask me, what, what a survivor who is still very weak, powerless, what would he do? First of all, he would like to recover. Second, to look after maybe there is somebody of his family survived. Here, I will tell you in advance that out of 47 closest members of my family, it means fathers, great grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles, and cousins, first rank, 47 survived. Imagine it was a, a order, I didn't know it, my mother who underwent positively the selection and was bought by Bergen Belsen. And then she spent the time in a, a relatively good concentration camp in Salzweil as, as a subcamp of Bergen Belsen. Then my cousin who was in Auschwitz, two cousin, girl cousins who joined the Russian partisans and one cousin who escaped and was 
in Russia in time of the war and returned to Poland and then to America in 46. So out of the 47 people. Now, so first, first thought how to find my mother, but I had, but I had to postpone it because I was weak. I had still to recover. When I returned to Poland, I was I went straight to a hospital in 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 Lower Silesia, and here would be an episode which would be of very great importance in my life. Imagine I was in a hospital next to the Czech border where usually Jews would smuggle out to get out from Poland to the West via Czechoslovakia, then Germany, and then looking their way. Either Bricha, those who were dedicated Zionists to Israel, or to stay in in, in German DP camps, and so on, so on, so on. You know it very well. And to, when I was just recovered a little bit in this little border town named Friedland, today it's called Miroshu, this is just on the border. A Jewish tailor, he seemed to be much older. He was, at the time, 30 years old. I considered him to be an old man. A, a tailor, just Adam Pashut, well, people in the state who, led, who lost his entire family, surviving in the Soviet Union, returned, nobody found, decided to smuggle via this Friedland, this, this little town to the west, to, 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 to the open world. He met me, was interested in my story, and told me, please, do me a favor. Make a picture with me. In those days, 95% of the population were Germans. So we went to a German photographer. He gave him a, a chocolate tablet as to, to pay for the photographs, for the pictures. He took the pictures and left Poland. Imagine a couple of weeks afterwards, what happened to him? A, a young Jew who knows only a little bit Polish, he knows Polish, a little bit Russian, and of course Yiddish. He's looking for other Jews in Germany to join them. And so he was just going from one DP camp to another, once he met a group of DP people from Poland, and they asked him, how is it in Poland? How is it? Could you tell us? And he told, told them some stories and told them also, listen, I have with me some pictures from Poland, from, from Breslau, from Wrocław, from Warsaw, from Łódź, from other places, I'll show you. So he put all the pictures on the table. Between the pictures was my picture. Between those who looked at it was my mother. Imagine the same day, the same day, she didn't wait a moment. She probably has saved 30 Deutsche Mark at this time. So he took her Deutsche Mark, bought a watch for her son, took a train, and arrived in Poland in order to meet her son. So you see how starts a life, a new life of her son, of his mother. There was a let me ask you a, a very, we're going to go reverse order. Marin, why did you decide to stay in Poland? My goal. That's a, that's a question you're asked all the time. I know that. Michael, imagine 
that you were a French Jew in Auschwitz. And he would go back to France. Would, would you ask him why he returned to France? Less than Poland. Hmm? Less than Poland. France, yes. was much, France was much less destroyed. And France was, France, however bad it was. Yes, was, okay. Nevertheless, M Michael. No, I understand. I, I, I'm not no, no, challenging you. No, I'm this, asking. No, no, this is only a diplomatic answer. But you, I am in debt to answer you. I am in debt also in memory, in blessed memory of my wonderful father. My father wanted me to be a Zionist and he, and I was grown up in this spirit. At home, it is very seldom. I spoke with my father only Hebrew, with my mother only Polish because she didn't speak Hebrew. She was a suffragist. She was a little, she was a socialist. Okay. And he was a dedicated Zionist. I can tell you, Eliyahu Turbovich, because my name was Turbovich, he was one of those members of the Kfutza which founded the Ganya Beit. So you know who he was. Right. But, and he was proud of me because I was my, myself and David Sherakover, who was, you know, who was David Sherakover, the author of the famous diary. He was in my, in my, in my uh, class. We were two challenging who is a better Hebrew. Hebrew. He would know. Sometimes I, I was sure that I, he was sure that him. Nevertheless, in time of the war, it happened so that in my milieu, next to me, very active was a very leftist, in communist spirit, in a group of youngsters, very intellectual, open, and it was, believe me, a hard time for me because I knew everything about the purges in Moscow. I knew everything. It would be, I don't know if you want to, me to come into details, but it was a long time till they convinced me that I should join an extreme, in a way, a leftist movement, but they were very active. And this was something a pattern for me. I know that my, it was, I heard my wonderful father. I have heard him very much. I have, it is a wound. It is, it is, to me, it is hurting me that I didn't have, have a chance, a time to explain to him that he, how, how much he was dear to me, his values, his, his morality, but I didn't have the time. So, mm, but nevertheless, after the war, I considered it as my duty coming back because Poland would become socialist. It means justice and equal for Jews, giving equal chances for Jews. I, well, to some extent it was so in the beginning. And also this is all so some kinds of, here I could understand those evangelists who go, who are a minority and want to convert. In a way, I did it. I tried to do, to do it. So I know I can't tell you all the stories on details. If you would be interested, I'm open to tell you everything. However, I decided 
that my duty is going back to destroy Poland, which would be now socialist, with equal rights to anybody, with human rights, etc., etc. Okay, let's let's go very briefly because we have a limited time. Uh, Gabriella, take us uh, a little bit more from your then. You you escaped uh, Hungary in 1956. Right. You were an immigrant yeah. again. You're an immigrant again. Take us through, but very very quickly in the basic elements of your story. Okay, so. We finally, because there was now a quota at, at the time when we wanted to come to America. So we didn't even know that we we're gonna be able to come. And then, you know, the word protexia, somehow we had some protexia and we made it here. So we made it here January 57. And uh, I did not know, I mentioned that before, how it was gonna be to be an immigrant without marketable skills for my parents, without any language knowledge, without any money, et cetera. Well, my father got a job in a medical instrument factory. My mother got a job in a tie factory. I started high school. That was the second semester. I kind of, the first semester got missed and they were incredible people. They never, never complained. I, I felt terrible because my well, father was such a dapper guy. Come around just where? In what city? Oh, sorry. I, the most important, I forgot to say that we came to New York City. My mother did have a cousin and we rented an apartment in their brownstone on the east side, not Lower East Side, Upper East mm. Side, 89th, 88th Street, and Madison Avenue, very good address. And I stayed in this kind of area my whole life. Very lucky for that. What happened? So I was working very hard. They were working very hard. They were studying English at night at home. My mother, who did not speak English, she was teaching my father. My father was 53. My mother was 38. Big age difference. And, uh, and I, was, I was determined that within six months, I was going to know this language really well. And that was that. I got into the high school, had what they called a country school, had an honor school, and I graduated in the end as second in my class. My father started a knitting business a year later which was okay, but then it just fell apart. But my mother, after three months, you know, we used to have a saying, I got my job through the New York Times. Well, my mother looked in the New York Times and, you know, she was an intellectual. She just, then she worked so hard in this Thai factory, piecework, just to make another penny. And finally, after three months, she said, I just have to do something with my brain. So she, they tested her. And she didn't do well in an English test, but she got 100 on a math test. They hired her as a filing clerk. Within a year or two, she became manager, taught herself bookkeeping. Very, very, in this family, thank God, the willpower, and I know a lot of Jews had that. Willpower was amazing. And I really, they were my role models. So my father also, he had a gorgeous voice. He studied. Um, voice, he studied, he, he went to conservatory in Leipzig before the war for four years. And he wanted to be an opera singer, but when he came back from Leipzig and he told his father, I want to be an opera singer, he said, you come back into the business and you'll use that as an avocation. Well, that he did. He became a cousin and so for three years in a row, on the high holidays, we went to, from New York, went to Trenton, New Jersey, and he would be the cousin, the cantor. And, and he loved it, okay? So fast forward a few years later, after the knitting, knitting factory kind of was kaput, he 
became a cantor near us in the Yorkville area called Yorkville Synagogue, but he wasn't just a cantor. He was everything. He was vice president. He was the gabai. He was the shah. He did everything. And he did that for 18 years. And you know what? Suddenly he had a business. He, that's, it was his life. He put his heart and soul into this. So that was great. And in the meantime, you what, take us for a couple of seconds. Okay, you, went on, you, you went on from high school to college? I went on from high school to college, but I have to stop for a minute because a lot happened and I'll be quick. So I graduated and I was going, my freshman year was gonna be at Queens College. And that summer I met my husband. My husband was also from Debrecen and he was also a survivor. And he was not like Stephanie hidden, he was hiding. He was hiding in Bratislava. And somehow that's how he survived. And so I, I meet this man. He finished uh, medical school just before he escaped from Hungary. And within a few months, you know, six weeks later, we got engaged. And four months later, we got married. So things did not exactly work out with college the way you think. But I was determined that I was going to finish this. However, thank God. And that's my vengeance to the Holocaust. We had, I'm the only child. My husband was the only child. We had four children and wonderful families. And so every time it was the right time that I didn't give birth, I went to school at night. And it took me 10 years until I got my BA. I transferred from Queens College to Hunter College and I got my BA. And then I did my master's degree in counseling. And I got hired, I worked for a very large human service agency. Uh, the last 10 years I was the head of quality improvement and you know, vice president of developmental so disability. What, fabulous. Steph, uh, uh, Stephanie, why don't you take us uh, through again we left you off somewhere in 1957. What, what is that? Catch us, catch us up as well. Well, I never were going backwards a little bit. I never went to school in Poland uh, because, unfortunately, I have to tell you, Marianne, my mother and I experienced anti-Semitism after the war in Poland. We were as non-Jews, and. Um, one day somebody came to my mother and told her not to let your little daughter go out because the Jews, you know, they need the blood of Polish children. So my mother said, thank you very much. And immediately she had a friend who was a dentist, a Jewish guy, but of course not living as a Jew. And he had a big German shepherd and I was not allowed out on the street unless I was out with Rex, the German shepherd to protect me. And then one day in the middle of the night, my mother and I left only with what we could carry, which was mostly food. And we went out in the middle of the night and caught a train out. And uh, went to, we couldn't leave Poland because the Russians were there. So we were in Gdansk for six weeks waiting to get out. And uh, finally we got out and it was kind of interesting because before we got out, we were told when you cross the border on the train and the Russians come on board the train and they speak to you in Russian or Polish, make believe you don't understand anything. And I never understood why that was until um, Michael, maybe you know, I forget what year it was, but it was in, in what, maybe 30 years ago, maybe or less when there was a meeting at the Holocaust Museum about what happened in those days after the war. And that's when I went to the meeting and I learned that we were leaving Poland as Turks because you know, all the different countries, people were on the march all over Europe. And so we were leaving as Turks going back to Turkey. So we were not to acknowledge that we understood either Polish or Russian, which was very interesting, I thought. 
anyway. Um, sure. Just give me one more wrap up for a moment. Take me through because I have to leave. My uh, family is pressing me. We have to be somewhere for a family event this afternoon. So take us through very, very quickly. And I apologize. I promise them two o'clock and I have to deliver. Okay. So anyway, um, so um, I told you we left Poland and we were in Vienna. We were in the P camps in Vienna. First the Rothschild Hospital in Vienna and then other two P camps. And then because I had TB, we couldn't come to the United States. And eventually with the help of Hayas, uh, we made it to the United States. My mother had remarried in the DP camps after the war. And I'm sure I, I don't need to tell you not all these marriages were such excellent marriages after the war. And this one was one that wasn't so ideal. And then uh, we came to New York in New York, not far from where you were talking. We lived in first in Brooklyn and then each Sunday, I would take the subway to Washington Heights and knock on all the apartment buildings to see if there was a vacancy somewhere because my father's one brother had survived in Shanghai and he was now in New York. And we wanted to be near where he was because we didn't have family. So eventually I found an, an apartment on Bennett Avenue in Washington Heights. And that's why I was, and I went to high school in New York. And then um, I got married and continued with education, speaking of a master's degree in counseling. I wound up with one as well. And after having gone to several different schools, but finally I, I went to Boston because my ex-husband was moving from one to the other. And finally I was still seven credits short so I wrote a letter to Michigan State University where I had been admitted to the Honors College. And um, I said, I believe life has taught me at least seven credits worth. And I got my diploma from the Honors College by mail. <laughs> so I, that was I it. Am gonna have, I'm gonna have to switch over to Sebastian. But first of all, thank you. Secondly, I deeply apologize. But I'm gonna switch over to Sebastian and Sebastian has a surprise for our guests. Let me just thank you. Remember, this is Holocaust Survivors Day. We appreciate all that you have done, all that you have contributed, and we're profoundly grateful for your example and for your witness and your courage. I'm going to drop off. Sebastian, you have a presentation to make. My apologies, but I have no choice at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you. That was great. And I would like to and I would like to thank all the all our panelists. This was this was absolutely amazing, and we could stay on here for hours uh, and and listen to your stories because you you bring in so much. And and this day is about to celebrate you. And we thank all the attendees that join us here and on YouTube and on our website and hundreds of people watching. And as I wrote in the chat, we have a we have a special surprise prepared by. The International March of the Living, and I'm going to show a short clip that they recorded especially for, for the panelists and for everybody watching. I guess we're signing off, huh? No, 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 we're going to hear Shahayana. Oh, okay. Special program. Stay on. I can't, can't hear her. Can't hear her. Oh, that's no good. We need to hear it. Che 
So thank you everybody again for joining us today for the inaugural Holocaust Survivor Day. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you, Marianne. Happy birthday, Marianne. And thank you. Happy birthday, Marianne. We look forward to hearing many, many more wonderful stories from you and celebrating you. And, and for everybody who joined us partially, uh, this whole recording will be available on our website. We'll make sure to send out the links for everybody who joined. So thank you so much. And we'll see you, see you again soon. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.